Hello, this is your Professor Joseph. Today I'm going to be covering a Chapter 1 test review, and in order to do that, I'll, I'll be uh, going through a mock exam, showing you different things you might be tested on. Um, so to start, just as a review, I, I mentioned this with your Chapter 2 exam as well, but if you go to your Hurley text in MindTap, or whatever um, you're using, depending on whether you're in my online class or in person, but either way, if you go to the end of chapter one, summary, it gives a good summary of pretty much everything you've learned in the chapter. Now, some chapters are better than others. This one's all right. It gives you definitions of the basics. So as I'm going through, if you want more clarification, or more help on um, certain sections, you know, go back to those sections, but also this will help you too. It's like a mini cheat sheet. Um, okay, so also, if we go back to your modules, I've uploaded, if you go to 1.3, deductive and inductive handout. I'll show this to you. This is a really good cheat sheet for sections 1.3 and 1.4. Um, so what will be in there? Uh, there you go. You can print this out if you want and use this during your exam. I mean, it's, you know, it's open, open, open book, open notes. So basically you're on a timetable as far as completing it in MindTap. But, you know, again, no computers, no internet as far as if you have to access, um, uh, sorry, no computers means no internet. Of course, you you can use a computer because you have to use your MindTap book, and for a lot of you, that's on an ebook. Some of you have paid the extra money and downloaded a print copy, and that's what I mean when I refer to the book. So, anyways, um, you can print this out and use it. It breaks down inductive versus deductive quite nicely, and different character or forms of these arguments you'll see on either side. Um, and I may refer to this during this review. So. Let's go to mock test. Again, you're being tested on, and actually I'm gonna go back just to make it super clear. You're being tested on sections 1.1, 2, 3, 4, 5. If, if uh, for some reason during this class I've excluded one of these sections, then you can disregard that, but otherwise um, you're being tested on the whole thing or this is a review for the whole thing, whether you're being tested on each section or not, um, doesn't matter, because I do this video for all classes that I teach. So this is a review for the whole section or all the sections in chapter one. Okay, um, so let's go. Let's go to a mock test. Now the format of this test may be a little different than what you're seeing now depending on whether you're in person or using my mind tap. But the concepts, they'll be the same. <clears throat> so again, what you can do, you can pause this video and think about this and look at this and then push play if you want to hear me give you the answer. But it's not just about you getting the answers. You really got to work through this. So some of you, um, some of these sections inside the chapters are super easy. You could fast forward those if you want and go to the ones that you struggle with. But let's start at um, let's start at the first question. So an example here, you're going to have to distinguish arguments from non-arguments and identify the conclusions. If it doesn't have, if it's not an argument, then the, the answer is non-argument. If it is an argument, you got to tell me what sentence is the conclusion. So th these little dot dot dots that just they're not typing out the whole sentence, but they're telling you, hey, this is this is the whole sentence, but this we're just excluding that part to save room, you know, on the, on the paper. So let's do this first one. And I'll walk through a couple of these with you. And then for the rest, I'm just going to give you the answer. Okay. So what you want to do is think about this for a couple minutes, read through it. Tell me, what do you think uh, this is? Is this an argument? In other words, is there a conclusion that is supported with reasons and evidence, or is it just a non-argument? Somebody just talking or somebody just giving you information, but it's not really an argument. 
Um, and the other hint, and you can look back in the previous videos I've done for each of these sections is, um, and I believe this is video 1.1, the best thing to do, 1.1 1 .1 and 1.2, the best thing to do is look for trigger words. And if you don't see a trigger word, meaning a conclusion indicating word or a premise indicating word, try to imagine the first statement or the first sentence here. Try to imagine it being the conclusion or try to imagine the last statement being the conclusion. Usually the first or the last will be the conclusion. Every once in a while, you'll get a conclusion in the middle, which I don't advise as a writer, you know, somebody writing something to make an argument like that but you want to make it easier on your reader so try with this one try this first sentence could this be a conclusion and what that means is if that's a conclusion does everything else below it support that if it does it's an argument whether it's a bad argument or a good argument is besides the point in this section we just want to know is it an argument or is this the conclusion? Is everything else before it support it? Okay, so um, usually that's a good rule of thumb to start with. So I will let you read through it. Actually, I'll read through it with you because I'm going to, you know, milk out these first couple. There appears to be a growing happiness gap between men and women. Women today are working more and relaxing less. While women are working less and relaxing more, or sorry, while men are working less and relaxing more. 40 years ago, a typical woman spends 40 minutes more per week than the typical man performing an activity considered unpleasant. Today, with men working less, the gap is 90 minutes and growing. So um, for those of you that are still working through this, you could push pause and think about it on your own. But I will give you the answer, and it is D. So basically, there appears to be, right here, there appears to be a growing happiness gap between men and women. So that's the conclusion, and everything else below it is supporting this. Meaning a growing happiness gap, meaning the happiness between men and women are getting less and less. Because, you know... This is making the argument that um, right in the first statement, this is support for this. Women are working more and relaxing less. So women are working harder and they're, they're less happier than men. So anyways, that's the conclusion. And it is an argument because all of this supports that first statement. Now let's go to number two. Okay. Lead is toxic, but do you know why? Lead is toxic mainly because blah, blah, blah. We'll read that. And then let's just say, let's say we start with that. Now, this is tricky because it's a question, right? But it could be that even though it's in the form of question, of the form of a question, it's really making the argument, hey, lead is toxic. And, but do you know why that's rhetorical? That's just saying, look, all this could support this. So now you're gonna have to read it and see, does every single statement literally support that lead is toxic? Okay, that's one way of looking at it. Or could this be the conclusion? Lead also displaces calcium, blah, 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 which diminishes. That seems like a lot of information coming at you. It, sorry. I'm, I didn't mean to highlight and there. That seems like a lot of information coming at you. It seems more of like a premise than it does a conclusion. And you could, you could even ask, you know, is this the conclusion, you know, instead of this other one? But either way, um, my advice is to start with the first statement or the last and figure out, does everything else support those two? So I will let you do that now. Think about it for a couple of minutes. And if you can't find what looks to be a conclusion indicating statement, then maybe it's the whole thing's a non-argument. It's just giving you information, but it's not really connected to where it forces a conclusion on you, whether it's good or bad, you know. 
Well, let's let's imagine that lead is toxic. <clears throat> let's imagine. Every single statement should be supporting this. So the first one, lead is toxic mainly because, okay, so that first statement looks like, yeah, that's definitely supporting this. What about this one? In so doing, it interferes with the proteins that regulate blah, 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 hema production, sperm reduction. Okay, so we're starting to veer off this whole statement right here doesn't say anything about lead being toxic. It talks about blood pressure, hemoglobin, sperm production. So you immediately know that statement does not support that. Therefore, um, either this whole thing is not an argument or this isn't the conclusion. <clears throat> so to give you the hint. And if you look, you'll find out that this statement talks about other things, but it doesn't talk about lead being toxic. So long story short, how many of you got C, non-argument? That's why. Well, if you did, it's it's correct. So if you thought this was the conclusion, all you got to do is see, does all this support this? No. One statement does, but the rest don't. But again, all statements have to support that for it to be an argument. So again, non-argument gives you a good amount of information about lead. But it doesn't make an argument about lead being toxic. Okay. So let's do three. For this one, I am now going to let you be the eagle, the, the baby eagle or the eaglet, and I'm going to push you out of your nest and let you fly for the first time and flap your wings. Now, again, we've already talked about this in previous videos, but here you are staring down the barrel of your mock chapter one exam. See if you can do number three on your own. You can push pause, think about it, come back, I'll give you the answer. Okay, we are back. How many of you thought E? Non-argument. If you did, you were correct. So you could have looked at the first and the last statement or any other statement in there to figure out, is it a conclusion? Do you, do you see all other statements lining up? No, it's, it's a bunch of information, but it's not connected to be an argument. So three is not argument. Let's go to four. Okay. Again, you can push pause. You can look at this. You can think about it. Um, and if you're driving in your car listening to this, I highly don't recommend it because you're literally going to have to read these. So don't drive. Stop your car. Focus. Read. We'll come back and we will see what you think. So how many of you got... A, that's because A is correct. It is not correct to say, now this one is awesome, why? Why is this one an easy one for the most part? How many of you thought that thus was a conclusion indicating word? Bingo, you are right. It is a conclusion indicating word. Go back to your, in the beginning of your chapter, section, uh, I feel like if it's one or uh, 1.1 or 1.2, or even, this cheat sheet handout. Um, eh, we don't have thus there, but you know, let's see. While we're at it, let's go to the book. Let's go. Let's see. Hmm. We don't have thus there either, even though those are conclusion indicating words. No problem. Let's go, let's go to, and this will be the last one that I milk out for you. Yeah, so section 1.1. There you go. Thus, see that? That was the conclusion indicating word. So what you have to do is find out, okay, is this, okay, this is a conclusion indicating word, so it seems like if this was an argument, this has to be the conclusion, right? Like it's it's super obvious. All you gotta do now is find out, does everything up here support this? And it turns out, yes, it does. Everything up there supports, it is not correct to say that illegal immigrants contribute nothing to communities in which they live. In fact, they do contribute things, and here are those things up above, okay? So, there's your answer for number four. It was kind of easy. It gave you a conclusion indicating word. 
So you had to find out, is it a conclusion? Or sorry, it is a conclusion, but is it an argument? Like, do all this, do all these statements support this? Let's go to five. And you can pause this, look it over. And I'm just going to give you the answer now. These are, you're, you're now a new eaglet flying out of your nest. You're doing these on your own. How many of you got B? Non-argument. That just means there could be good information there. But there is no conclusion that's being supported by every other statement in there. Okay, let's go to six. You can push pause and look at this. So how many of you got E? It is an argument. And furthermore, that is the conclusion. So basically, all of this down here supports that. So it's an argument. That's the conclusion. And last but not least, for this section, we'll do seven. And then I will go into a different section of your test. This is just, again, once, once again, giving you exposure to these types of problems that you could see identifying an argument from a non-argument, and then sp specifically identifying the collusion. So seven, how many of you got C? Wait, give me a second, oh, oh, give me a second. Sorry, I'm looking at two cons two computer screens here. Yeah. Oh, that's why, because the dot 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 confused me. So that is, that's the conclusion. Let's see. They just didn't put a dot 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 afterwards. And you know, in fact, what they're what they're really trying to say is this. They're really trying to say. That's the conclusion for many reasons just means, hey, this is just a, a little mini clause. And you're saying that, hey, everything else following this are the reasons or evidence to believe this is the conclusion. So if you thought that whole thing was a conclusion, yeah, but very specifically, it's this. For many reasons, well, those are all the premises coming at you. OK, so once again, seven is C. Oh, sorry. My gosh. How in the world? Oh, I made a huge boo-boo there. No, 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 I didn't. Oh, whew. I don't know why. I thought I had a little slight double vision there. I thought it was, <laughs> I thought it said an argument. I'm like, no. Yeah, yeah. So see, when I was about to point to this, my mouse slipped and I thought it was this. But anyways, that's on my behalf. So again, you can highlight that. You can push pause. You can analyze this over and over. And you can find out, does everything support this? You know, does, does do all these statements, which if it's an argument, they are premises that support this conclusion? Yes. And you know what? I'll throw one more in there just in case some of you. And I mean, I, I know this is mind bending or uh, mind numbing, you know, to study like this, but. For those of you that want to go the extra mile, I will give you eight and nine. Okay, let's first do eight. Take a look at that. Eight is a non-argument. How many of you got that? Pat yourselves on the backs. You are flying eagles now. You're not. You're no longer eaglets. You're flying eagles. You're getting through this. Nine. Push pause. Think about this. Read it. How many of you got D? That's right. It is an argument. And um, how, neur how neurons work. So this, in fact, you even have, sorry, let you see this. So it'd be like the conclusion, right? Well, you even have that, which is a conclusion indicating word. So thus, hence, therefore, all those, you know, as a consequence. So that is a really good giveaway. So as for review for this little mini section on all these problems we just did, 
Look for trigger words for conclusion indicating statements. You know, if you can't find them, try the first and the last statements. Find out if each, if you think you found what looks to be a possible conclusion, find out does every single statement support it? If one statement doesn't, then the whole thing's not an argument because every statement has to support it. So if you want review, more review, go back to the um, other sections. Now we're going to go to a different kind or different types of problems now. Um, which you might see in my in-person class or your online class for MindTap. However you come across this. Once again, we're testing the concepts here. So this wants you to evaluate inductive versus deductive arguments. This cheat sheet could help. It's not exhaustive. It doesn't show everything, but it does break down some pretty good things that I will show you in a minute. If the Big Bang Theory is correct, and yeah, basically you have to figure out which answer is it. And all of this should be review of, I, you know what, I used to have another, let's go. Yeah, that's the recognizing, okay. I believe this is 1.3, so let me go. Oops. Sorry. You don't have to look at the screen for this part right here. Yeah, deduction, induction, 1.3. It's 1.3 and 1.4, basically, this section here that we're reviewing. So, 18. <clears throat> um you can go back to this section and those videos where I really try to unpack this. You're looking for hints on the form or the character of the argument. Is it deductive? Is it inductive? Does it make a necessary claim? Does it have certain trigger words like if thens? Um, you know, does it in fact, we'll look right here. So if then, therefore, you know, it could be a hypothetical syllogism. It could be a modus ponens, modus tollens. I'll show you that. And those are, or sorry, I won't show you that now, but that's in your video um, for those sections. Categorical syllogisms. Does it use words like all, none, some? Does it use either or? That's a typo. Is it, you know, it could be disjunctive syllogism. All of these are deductive. They force necessary or certain conclusions on you, okay? They're talking about validity and soundness. Does it use an analogy? Does it use a generalization? Does it talk about authority and witnesses, signs and symbols, causes and effect, past and present? That would be inductive. These would be strong or cogent, not valid or sound. So this kind of terminology is not for inductive. It's only for deductive. And this one's only for inductive, not deductive. So you just got to get familiar with this. Does it make Conclusions that aren't necessary or certain, but like probable, improbable, plausible, likely, unlikely, things like that. Those are all trigger words for inductive. So you can look at that cheat sheet. So on this one, I'm just going to do this for you. Let's see. In that section, um, I, I teach you how to map out the if-then statements. So I'm just going to do it really fast just to see if we can get a form going up there. Oh, sorry, jeez. If Big Bang, so I'm gonna do if B, then universe is billions of years old. I'm just gonna say, oh, sorry, can't do that. I can't use B twice for something different. So I'll say, if the Big Bang is correct, then Universe is billions of years old, so O represents old. And if Big Bang Theory is correct, um, so you might say that's premise one, premise two. And it seems to repeat itself if Big Bang is correct. And once again, where did I get that? This first one, right before the comma. So the if is an antecedent, the then is a consequent. You can look back to that part of the chapter. Then the universe was not created in six days, so I'll say not S or not, not six days. So those are two conditional statements. 
Then it says thus. Thus is a conclusion indicating word. So we, we have another conditional if the universe is billions of years old. So that would be back up to this one, which I identified as O. Thus the O. Then it was not created in six days. Not S. So basically, since I'm using if thens, and it looks like some sort of hypothetical syllogism, we know it's deductive. Like you have to get that part. It, like it'll either be deductive or inductive for any one of these answers, right? But now is it is it invalid or valid? So take a look at that. How many of you got? How many of you got E? You know it's deductive, but you know, is it, is it valid? No, it turns out not. So it's invalid. And why? Because these, the B, the B right here in the O. So if B and O, then I have if B, then not S. And nothing's connecting. Let me show you a way that it would be a hypothetical syllogism and, and how it would be valid. Let me just, I'm going to take out my if thens, but I'm just going to show you, okay? Go right here. Let me show you now how it would have to look. Something like, and I'll use an arrow instead, but let's you, you'll get the point. V O, let's say O, not S. Then the conclusion would be something like B, then not S. The point here is you start with, let's just say that's an imaginary premise one, premise two, conclusion. So what I'm doing is I'm showing you if we have B, right here. And then we have O, no problem. Then we drop down the O's connect. Then we can force if we have B, then we have O, if we have O, then we have not S, then we can force B, then not S. So it turns out this links up the right way. So it turns out that's inclusion. So this would be valid because it, because it has the right form. Again, go back to that section in your book and look at how Hurley, he gives you multiple examples of a good hypothetical syllogism. And you have to connect a certain way, whereas this does not. For example, does the O and the B connect? No. They have to be the exact same for the hypothetical syllogism to work, O and O. Okay? That's why it's invalid. Now, I'm not going to milk out all these, but I did for this one. So hopefully that helps you, okay? So you have to have certain patterns here. The easy one is the if-thens. I got a bunch of if-thens, right? I know it's deductive. So in that case, think of your think of this mock review like elimination. I'm eliminating B, C, and D immediately. In other words, I know those aren't the answer because they're inductive. So I know it's either A or E. I know it's either valid or invalid. Okay? Just by looking at the if thens and just by going to this cheat sheet, if thens, I immediately rule out this whole section right there. So I know if, if I see if thens. I know it's deductive. Therefore, I know B, C, and D come right off the map. And I'm only looking at two possible answers. So you might say, when you come to these questions, try to eliminate the weakest possible answers and go for the, there should be two, maybe three left, usually two, but sometimes three, and just try to pick the best answer out of those. So yeah, the review, or sorry, when you come to your test, first thing you do, eliminate the weak ones then solve for the strongs. Okay, 19, the engraved plate beneath this painting, the art museum says Monet, therefore the painting must be the work of Monet. And for this one, you can push pause, you can think about it, you can go back to that section. D, inductive, strong. It's not certain that it's Monet, but most likely it's Monet. It's inductive. Um, could it be a possibly like a forged painting? Yeah, but most of the time when you walk in to a museum and you look at something and beneath it, it says Monet, chances are highly, highly possible it's Monet. Okay, so that's inductive, strong. Um, 20. So in this one, I will give you a hint. Take a look at it. Tell me what you think. 
we can push pause, but here's a hint, similar. See that right there? That is a word that might trigger an analogy. Bingo, similarity between two items, affairs, or events. So if something similar or it's like something else, it's an analogy, which means it's inductive. Ding, 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 ding. You know what I'm saying? So you go down here and you know, ah, this is an analogy. You know it's you know it's inductive, so that means this comes off, this comes off, that comes off. You know it's either A or C at this point. Is it weak or strong? So is it a strong analogy or weak? Go back to that section in the video where I talk about this or look at the Hurley examples. In order for something to be the strong analogy, it's comparing two things. And you might see it uh, X, Y, and Z properties x y and z properties between them if they have many of the same properties you know it's what strong strong analogy right but what if you try to compare two things and it looks like this uh you say something like yeah or you show something like A has X, Y, and Z properties, but B only has X. Well, then that would be weak. Not enough properties that are similar between them. And the more, the merrier. Let's say you're comparing two things and it has six properties that are similar. Hey, you've got a strong analogy. So, what do you think? You're now eaglets flying or, or eagles, sorry, flying around. You've been pushed off the nest and you think to yourself, what is this answer? And A, weak analogy. <laughs> so, you're claiming that Canada is similar to the United States. That would be the conclusion. This would be the inductive argument. And then you start giving examples and you say, look, dude. Um, oh, sorry, sorry. Skip that part. Oh, you're claiming. You're claiming that the Canadian flag, and we know this because of the therefore. That's the conclusion indicating. So the Canadian flag must look like the U.S. flag. Um, we know it's, you know, an analogy. And then you say, okay, both countries share language values of free market. They also share a common border. Just because they have those properties doesn't mean that their flags look the same. So it's a weak analogy, okay? What about 21? Either Bill or George Bush was president, blah, blah, blah. Therefore, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, how many of you see trigger words in here that give it away deductive or inductive push pause think about it okay we're back how many of you saw either or if you did and and once you saw those you thought deductive you went back to your reading you thought oh yeah i got this or you went to your cheat sheet and you saw that of course like i said earlier that's a typo but I'm just saying, you saw that and you thought, oh, it's deductive, right? Well, you're right. Either or, it's deductive. So you take off A, D, any, e. they're automatically gone because you know they're not inductive. You're dealing with deductive. It's either valid or invalid. So we could map this out. You could say either bill. So let's just say, and by the way, um, we have two choices and we have an either or. So either Bill or G for George Bush, two. But Bush was not president at the time, so not B. Therefore, Bill Clinton was president. Oh, sorry, sorry. Oh, I know what I did. I made a mistake. Hold on. I did this, so premise two, not G, not George Bush, right? Conclusion, therefore, uh, Bill Clinton. So how many of you thought B, deductive valid? Will you be right? So here's what has to happen for the deductive syllogism. You're given two choices. You know you're given two choices by the either or. 
Okay. Boom. Either or. Two choices. Here's my choose choices. You can use any letter you want to symbolize these, by the way. You could use a C or a W or a G. doesn't matter. you got two choices. You must eliminate one. You must eliminate one. And what that means is I have a G and then I have a not G. How do I get the not G? But Bush was not president at the time. Not. Right? So I'm negating these two. If I negate these two, then I can safely bring B down. Let's see this a different way. A or B? Not A. I negate those two. Therefore, B. It's so simple. Um, think, think of it like a, like a dog chasing a rabbit down a, a trail, right? And then there's a fork in the road, and it's either left or right. So you say, either the rabbit went down the trail left, or the rabbit went down the trail to the right. And then the dog thinks, well, it wasn't to the left. Therefore, it was to the right and the dog goes. I mean, this is very basic logic. You might say the dog works on impulse, but you might also say the dog works has reasoning skills. The dog might have had evidence that it didn't go down um, the left trail and that it only went down the right because maybe it smelled or saw something. So you can see this play out in all kinds of choices in your life. But the bottom line, two choices. Eliminate one, you have the other. Okay, so... Once again, the answer is B. And again, I always suggest when you come to these problems, pause it right away, try to figure it all out, try to struggle through it, then you can hear my answer. Why? Because if you don't try to struggle through these problems on your own and use that intellectual, intellectual logical muscle inside your mind, brain combination, you won't be learning and understanding the concepts. You will just, you know, be looking at the answer, but come exam time, you'll be like, uh, so really, really try to work through these. Okay. Try to go back to that section of the book. Try to look at your cheat sheet. So let's, let's do 22. So from here on out, I'm just going to start giving some answers on this section. Okay. <clears throat> you can push pause. 22. All right. So here we are. We're back. 22 is D inductive strong. So, inductive strong. We know this is the conclusion, possible conclusion, because we have a therefore. We have premise one, we have premise two, you know. Um, how many of you know why it's the case that it's inductive? There's, there's a certain form that should have stood out to you. <clears throat> so, let's see if we can find it. As the universe expands, it gets colder and colder. Furthermore, the expansion will continue forever and ever. So, is it making a claim, prediction based upon known past or present event? Yes. There you go. Prediction. Therefore, ding, 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 inductive. And all you have to ask yourself is, is it strong? Like, if you read that, you read this, would this probably follow? And that's how you work these arguments out, by the way. You read the possible premises and you say if I were to grant that these premises are true and again this is review from previous videos if I were to grant that those premises are true would the conclusion follow necessarily or would it follow probably that's the bottom of the barrel basic on how to try to find out you know whether it's inductive or deductive but in this one if you go a step further you could get a specific form that stands out at you because you read it and you go, oh, that looks like a that looks like a prediction. I already know that that's inductive. So I already know it's not my, ma, trying to. I already know it's not trying to make a necessary conclusion. It's trying to make a probable. That's how science works, or plausible. It's not trying to make a necessarily, certainly, absolutely. Okay. It's not trying to use. It's not trying to be like uh, a geometric proof or mathematics or hardcore logic. It's trying to be scientific saying, well, it's possible that it's not true, but looks like it's pretty strong that it's true. Okay. So once again, D inductive strong 23. So you can take a look at this one. You can pause it. This one is E deductive invalid. So I will just move on 24 hint hint. This looks very mathematical. 
And if it looks very mathematical, chances are the inductives come right off. And how many of you got C, deductive valid? Yes. So this goes old school. Anybody, any, anybody remember? This is at least how I did it in my head. The 3 and the 5 times each other would equal the 15 or those uh, trinomials or, yeah, I think so. So basically you have to solve. So anyways, we know this is getting into that kind of language. We know it's deductive. It's valid. It works. You can solve this. It's not negative and negative. Um, you'd basically have to figure out, is this positive or negative? But that's beside the point. I'm just trying to tell you that's what it would, you know, back in our old school days of doing algebraic problems like that, you would notice that pattern. And if you went back to your cheat sheet, based upon mathematics. So that's just a giveaway there. So once again, the answer for 24 is C. 25. I will let you look at this. You can push pause. And you have to figure out deductive or inductive. And then is it strong or weak if it's inductive? And is it sound or you know, invalid or valid? So 25, the answer is B. Inductive weak. Um, you can look at that more. Go back to that section. Look at some other examples like that. Inductive just means, hey, there's my possible conclusion. If that were true, would this necessarily 100% follow? No. At best, it's either plausible or probable, meaning the more information I have, I can conclude that it's more likely to be true or false, that conclusion. So we know it's inductive. It's on a, it's on, and, and just for review for you, inductive is on a scale from zero to 100, but it could also be any number in between, right? So think about inductive. You're never going to get. OK, so let me do this. Let me just make it clear to you. That would be inductive, right? Deductive. The, 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 you know, the answer would be all or nothing, zero or one. It's either true or false, 100 percent. There is no middle ground. So basically, in inductive reasoning, it's never really going to be zero. It's never going to really be 100. But it could be one in between one and 99. So you might say at that point, is it weak? Is it like, I don't know, 20% possible? Or is it like 85 up to 99? You know what I mean? It's like a scale or a gradation. Um, the more information you have, the stronger it gets to 99 in very fancy scientific terms, this is called verisimilitude. It just means you're never going to get 100% accuracy, but you're going to get the closest possible truth, verisimilitudinal. There's your $50 word for the day. So on this one, we know that um, graffiti painted on a vacant building, first of all, there's one building that says boycott meat. Therefore, does it follow that? Everybody should become vegetarians? Absolutely not. That's why it's, we know it's inductive, but that's why I know, we know it's weak. But now, what if I changed it up on you? Because again, we're reviewing. What if I said there's 150 million vacant buildings throughout the United States that say boycott meat? Therefore, it's clear we should all become vegetarians. <laughs> Would I be making a stronger argument? Yes, because now we're going from one building to 150 million. In other words, 150 million instances of evidence that start accumulating big time. You're thinking, hey, maybe something's wrong. Maybe you should become vegetarians. So inductive, the more information or the more data you have, the stronger your argument. This is just me really hashing 25 out to give you more review. But there you go. So I'm basically showing you, yeah, this is inductive week. How could we make it strong? Well, you know, we give you more, more data.
then we can make it into something strong. 26, I'll let you pause, look at this, think about it. And the answer is E, inductive strong. That just means if you were to grant that these premises were true, if you were to say, look, I'm just going to hypothetically say that they are true. Would this probably follow? Yes. Therefore, it's strong. 27. And again, there's a conclusion indicating word, therefore. If you grant that this premise is true, would it probably follow that this is the case? Or would it necessarily follow? Like, what, what's your intuitions telling you there? Your logical intuitions? So, how many of you got inductive? You know it's inductive. Okay, good. How many of you got inductive weak? So, you know, when you looked at this, you ruled out deductive. You're like, even if I granted that premise true, it's not necessarily the case that this conclusion follows. So then you have to find out, all right, is it cogent, weak, or strong? Cogent means that you have a strong inductive argument plus true premises. Go back to that section. Um, in fact, I will show it to you now. We will go back together. We're all, we're all flying eagles at this point. We've all been pushed off the net. And by the way, wow, this lady is incredibly smart, way above my pay grade with what she contributed to logic. I just have to throw that in there. She scares me. Awesome. Okay, let's go back. This is a very good review. I think it's in 1.4. We'll find out. Yes. So right here. There you go. In order to have a cogent argument, you must have strong plus true premises, right? And you can see this really good review down here. You got statements, you got groups of statements, you got deductive, you got inductive, you know, and, it, and it's telling you about them. But my point with this is when you're looking for a cogent argument, you need two conditions. You need true premises, you need strong argument. And if we were to go up here to apply to the same thing with deductive, we see, in order, or sorry, yeah, with a sound argument, we need a valid argument plus true premises. So when we're talking about deductive or inductive, both of these, both of those need true premises. That's just number one. The difference is, is that deductive arguments require validity. Inductive requirements, uh, inductive arguments require strong. If you have both of those, then you for the deductive you have sound. And for the inductive, you can have cogent, okay? So the terminology is completely different from the two. Again, if you want to review, right here. There you go. Inductive. Again, we're looking at cogent or sound, all right? That's the terminology. For soundness, I need two things. I need true statements, and I need the argument to be valid. For cogent, I need true statements, and I need the argument to be strong. I need those two things. You must have those two things in order to have cogency or soundness. Okay. So again, that's review. So 27 C. So let's do 28. You can push pause and you can look at this if you want. 28 is D deductive invalid. 29. I'll do 28. I'll, I'll stall a little bit more. So I have an if then. I have an if. I have a then. So I'm just going to symbolize this. I'm going to just say if organic, then, sorry, my writing's a little soft here, then customers are misled. So I'll just say that's premise one. Organic food does not contain the pesticides, not O. Therefore, customers are not misled. What is that? That is called denying the antecedent. You know that that has a bad form, so you know that that's deductive invalid, okay? 
denying the antecedent and you can look you can look at that so it doesn't have the right form okay um 29 you can look at this 29 b inductive week you might say well that's inductive week how would you make it stronger Instead of the same thing happening to Nikki and Claire, how about the same thing happening to thousands of people, let's say? Then you somehow make it strong, okay? Otherwise, it's weak. You're only looking at two people. So the answer, 29B, inductive week. 30, I'm using all none sum words. So I'm using all. So now I have to figure out, is this deductive or inductive? You can push pause. This turns out to be A, deductive, valid. Okay, 31, you can push pause, you can look at this, 31 is E, inductive, strong, go back, look at that if you wanted um, to review it more, 32, you can push pause, think about this, um, okay, we're back, Brandon's a polytheist, I'm defining Brandon in one word. And if you look up polytheist, it means he believes in more than one God. So I'm giving you a definition. If you wanted to look at that based upon definitions right there. So I know it's deductive. And is it a good definition? Yes, it is. Deductive valid. Because polytheist is somebody who believes in more than one God. So that's deductive valid. Once again, I just showed you how to use your cheat sheet there. Not all the answers from your test might be on that cheat sheet, but a lot of them are. That cheat sheet's really helpful <clears throat> because it goes over, again, many different things, indicating trigger words, the nature of the links, whether it's going to be probable, plausible, cert and certainly necessary, the, the different kinds of forms that you might see the arguments in, how you might use them. I wouldn't really worry about the particular to the general because Hurley's going to give you examples where even though even though inductive arguments usually go from something very particular instance of evidence and it makes a claim about a general thing about reality, he also gives you an example of where the opposite could happen. And he does it here with this. So I wouldn't stress out too much about those two sections, even though they may be on your test just in general outside of your class, because Hurley gives you counter arguments to those, okay? He just says, look, usually this is the case. However, I can give you an example of where it's not. That's all I meant to say about that. 33, you can push pause, you can think about it. Okay, we're back, 33 is C. This is deductive, invalid. Okay. 34, deductive, in, and by the way, going back to 33, we know it's deductive because it has some mathematical kind of language, but does it follow necessarily if this is the possible conclusion? If we grant that that's the case, does this follow necessarily? No, something else is needed, some more information. Um, 34, Oh, and, and sorry, but but it still has the same language that would be used in a deductive. So we know it's deductive, but we need more information. Otherwise, it's still invalid. 34. You can push pause. Think about this. Okay, we'll come back. 34. Inductive, strong. It just means that possible conclusion um, was indeed supported by these premises up here. Premise 1. Premise two. Now we're into section three, which again, in, in your mind, top of your book, depending on how you get these um, questions, these are different types of questions that can come at you. So if you get these, um, this particular one is a two parter. Mind tap may or may not do this. What that means is question 35 and 36. If you get 35 wrong, you will definitely get 36 wrong. So you have to get this first part right in order to get 36 right. So on this one, um, you can look at a previous video, but I show you how to do this. 
So, um, we'll, we'll, we'll just try to symbolize this out and we'll try to see which one of these match. I think in a previous video, I tell you first, um, find the conclusion indicating sentence immediately. So let me see. Some cashew sweaters are fashionable. So this right here. Why would I section that out to be a conclusion indicating sentence? Because it has the word so. Okay, so it's right in the middle. So I start with that first. So some cashmere sweaters are not suede. So I'd go some. Some cashmere sweaters are not suede so some some c are not s some c are not s so boom i've eliminated this one this one and this one why because i've went for the conclusion indicating trigger word so and i find out okay this is definitely the conclusion and then i figure out let me map it out so some c or not c i'm oh, sorry sir some c or not s right and only two possible um argument forms down there work. So I know it's either D or E. Now I have to go map out this one up above. I'll let you do that. So you can figure out what premise, what premises up here work for this. And then you can push pause. You can look at that and then I'll give you the answer. So we're back and it turns out that the answer is, wait a minute. Oh, wow. I made a mistake. I don't know why I was quick to do that, but it turns out some C or not S. Oh, I looked at it backwards. Wow. This is what happens when you get older. <laughs> so it turns out some C or not S. I don't know why I canceled that one out. Oh, sorry. Why I didn't cancel that one out in the past. It's these two that are the possible candidates. It's B and E. I mean, I had it right here, but I was very quick to jump to the wrong one to rule it out. And this just goes to show you that I can make a mistake with my eyeballs pretty quickly, right? Well, so can you. So just take your time. So once I map out symbolically that this is the case for that conclusion, some C or not S, some C or not S, some C or not S. So I eliminate these other three first. So anyways, yes, it's B. And all that means is you have to figure out the premises now. Go back up there and map those out. So I know only B works, right? So then I take my B and I bring it down to, so my answer for B, and I'll bring it down some S or not F. Some S or not F, some C or F, some C or F, conclusion, some C or not S. So I have to find out which one of these are proved invalid by which one of these guys. So anyways, I just brought this down. So again, these are these, this came in a pair. Your mind tap may or may not have this. Um, but if you're doing an in-class exam with me on campus, you will most certainly have some example like this where you have to get this one right in order to get this one right, which means you have to translate into symbolic language, which I've went over in previous videos and showed you an example here. So what we're trying to do is prove invalidity. You can go back to that section of your book. Um, and I believe it's, do, 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 do. let's go to, I believe it's 1.5. Yeah, proving invalidity. You can go back to my video on 1.5. What that means is, you are purposely trying, and this is review now, 
you're purposely trying to choose one of these examples where premise one is true, premise two is true, and three is absurdly false. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to prove it invalid. So you don't have to know anything about the content of cashmere sweaters, garments, all that kind of stuff. You don't have to know anything about suede jackets, exactly how they're made. All you have to do is symbolize it and come down here and see if you can prove it invalid. Let's see if we can do it. So you have to now go through this and what I recommend is trying to make the conclusion absurdly false first and then trying to see which premises make this true. So I'll push pause. Or sorry, if I would push pause, try to work through this because this is hard for some of you, okay? And come back. Okay, now we're back. Let's see which one works. How many of you got E? Let's see. Some C are not S. Some cats are not animals. Uh, no, that's absurdly false. All cats are animals. So we know that that's false. And then you can plug away. We, we need the premises to be true with this one. So we'll say some S or not S. Or sorry, some S or not F. Some animals are not mammals. Okay, that's correct. You can have an animal without being a mammal. And then some C R F. Some cats are mammals. Yes. Because I can show you a cat and I can show you right away it's a mammal. So it turns out E makes one and two true and the conclusion false at the same time. It's the only one that works. So we know when you come to these examples, we know that it's going to be invalid. We already know that. You're trying to show um, me and, you know, by, by proving that you know this by getting it on your test, right? Try to show me how you prove it invalid. Well, you correctly symbolize it like we did down here. And then you correctly use which one of these makes the premises true, conclusion false. Again, go back to 1.5 video where we show you examples of this. And it turns out A through D will not work because if you were to try to plug A through D into this correctly translated, you will not get a false conclusion with both premises being true. You will, you will get scattered differences, okay? So this is the only one that makes this come out the right way. In other words, it's the only one that will prove that this argument is invalid. And what that means is, if I grant that these premises are true, the conclusion does not follow. That's all. We're just proving that it's invalid. 37, I will not do this for you. All I will say is try to start with the conclusion first. Is there a conclusion indicating word in here? How many of you saw thus? Yes. So you know that that is the conclusion indicating word. So therefore, you know that this is the conclusion, right? If that's the conclusion, try to symbolize this one out down here and eliminate the other ones that don't fit. Okay? That's your hint. Push pause. Try to work it out. Come back. Okay. We're back. This one is D. Give a second here. Yes. Thus, freedom of speech is not threatened. So how would you symbolize that? You got a letter down there, right? So you got like F, freedom of speech. You might say, okay, we got our F. Not threatened. Not F or not F. That little symbol that you see, we'll, we'll learn that in chapter six. It's the same thing as writing out the word not F. So there's only one that works, only one. Now, if you thought this because is part of the conclusion, no. Because, and get ready for this, that is a premise indicating word, not a conclusion indicating word. So even though the whole thing's attached together in a sentence separated by a comma, this is a premise indicating word. So it turns out it's separate from the conclusion. Therefore, we know 
and we can isolate this guy all by itself because of the word thus. He goes, he goes in a conclusion all by himself. So you know it's not F. And guess what? You don't even have to know how to map out um, this premise or this premise because we already know we got it. So we already know that this is mapped out this way. If M, then F, not M. Go back and look. Because we've nailed down the conclusion. And it was easy because there's no other answer that gives you a not F. So, okay, hard part's done. We got this. You take this and you say, which one of these guys can I put into here? To where I make the premises what? True and the conclusion false. That is what we do when we try to prove this whole thing invalid. Remember, go back to 1.5 if you want to review on this. And the only one that works, and push pause, try to figure this out. Okay, now we're back. The only one that works is, ta-da, C. The only one that works is if you were to substitute this in, so it says not F, right? That's the conclusion. Abraham Lincoln is dead. That's F, not F. Abraham Lincoln is not dead. Uh, whoa, that's absurdly false. We know he's dead like a long time ago. And if we select this one um, and we plug this, uh, these two up into our premises, we'll find out that they're both true and this is false. So anyways, that might be conceptually one of the hardest things that you may encounter during your test, but hopefully I've mapped it out pretty well here. And then you can go back to your 1.5 video that I've already made. And I will just, yeah, I'll give you 39 and 40. So 39, you can push pause. 39 is E. You can look at that one yourself. And 40, if you want to push pause. So I've taken E now and I've brought it down here and I've tried to figure out which one of these works to make this true and this false. In other words, to make the premise true and this conclusion false. The only one that works is C. So you can look at this and you can look at this and you can figure out why both of them must work to prove um, that argument invalid. Okay. Now we get to an easy part, or these will be, in my opinion, very easy questions, or possibly the easiest part of your whole test. Questions like these that you may see in my in-person class or mind tap. So these, I'm just going to say, go back to that section of your book and look at it. They're, in my opinion, they're painfully easy as long as you know the definitions. So, for example. Which of the following are premise indicating words? Which one of these are just premise indicating words? Go back to that section in your book. I believe it's 1.1. Push pause if you want to struggle through this, which is not really a struggle at all. And the question is, or the answer is, D. Only D works. They're all premise indicating words. How about 42? Which are all? Which of the following are all arguments? Or argument forms? They are B, predictions, categorical syllogisms, argument from signs. Predictions is inductive, categorical syllogism, that's deductive. Argument from signs is inductive, but they're all arguments, right? Because arguments are, are either deductive or inductive. And it's just trying to say, hey, only B has argument forms. How do I know this? Because D these are all examples of non-argument forms. Remember that? You can go look at that. Okay. And the other ones don't work as well. You can look at those as well. 43, which of the following are all deductive arguments? You may even say, let me go to my cheat sheet. Let me see if I can you know, find them in there. Or you can go back to the reading. And it is a... Hypothetical, disjunctive, and argument based upon mathematics. You could have got that off your cheat sheet or just looked in this section. 44, an argument whose conclusion based on some geometrical procedure is deductive. Again, 
geometrical proof, geometrical procedure, deductive. Um, 45, an argument whose conclusion rests on a similarity between two things. Two things are alike. How many have you got? B, inductive. What is it? It is an analogy. That's the kind of, that's the specific form of the inductive argument. It's an analogy. Okay, you compare two things. 46. Expression, blah, 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 blah. You can read that. Push pause. Come back. Which one is it? And we're back. And the answer is A, explanandum. Look that up. Explanands, explanandum. One is doing the explanation. The other one is the word to be explained or group of words to be explained. You can look that up. 47. And the expression, blah, 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 blah. What are we looking for? You can push pause. Okay, we're back. 47 is E, antecedent. So when you have an if, when you have a then, um, a nation engages in torture, you can look. Anything preceding the if will always be an antecedent. Anything following the then is always a consequent. Go back and look at that section. 48. So the following is a sufficient condition for committing the crime. In other words, if I do this, um, it's an instance of, I can have multiple sufficient conditions for committing a crime, but I'm going to give you one. Again, you can push pause and D, robbing a bank. So robbing a bank is a sufficient condition, meaning it counts as an instance of committing a crime. I can think of another sufficient condition for committing a crime. What could it be? I don't know jaywalking or robbing 7-Eleven or, you know, you could think of hundreds, thousands of examples of committing a crime. A sufficient condition says, look, this just counts. Sorry, sloppy handwriting. Counts as an instance of, I can think of multiple instances of committing a crime. This is just one. 49, which of the following is a necessary for playing baseball, meaning I have to have it. If I don't have it, it's impossible for me to play baseball. And you can push pause. And we're back. 49 is C. I have to have a bat. If I do not have a bat, I'm not going to be playing baseball. Okay, 50. And I think we're down to the end of this mock exam. If a deductive argument has one premise and true conclusion, then we know... A, nothing about the arguments, validity, and this is one of those things you have to go back to section 1.3 and 1.4, and you have to look. In order to have, you can have a true premise and a true conclusion, but to in, order, in order to know whether it's valid, the, the premise has to connect or support the conclusion. Okay, so I'll give you an example of this. Like right now, right now, as I'm talking with you, Joseph is wearing purple. I'm wearing a purple shirt. You know what I'm saying? It's true. And then I say, Joseph loves Baron Munchen. That's a soccer team. Both of those are true. I totally love soccer. Are you kidding me? And oh my gosh, you just have to let you know. Bayern Munchen just won Champions League. All right, just got to brag. Anyways, so both statements are true, right? One's a premise, one's a conclusion. So it says, if a deductive argument has one true premise and true conclusion, we know nothing about the argument's validity. I'm giving you an example. I'm giving you a true premise that has nothing to do with the conclusion. Me wearing purple has nothing to do with me loving soccer at all. So even though I have those, and even though it could be deductive, they have nothing to do with each other. In order to have a valid argument, um, it has to connect. 
so I could say I'm wearing purple. Um, I have all kinds of purple shirts. I'm giving you examples now of premises. And then I say, therefore, um, you know, I love purple. That would be valid because I'm giving you examples of me wearing a purple, me having a lot of purple shirts, and then conclusion, I love purple. Do you see how that connects to the conclusion? Whereas me wearing purple does not connect to me loving at soccer at all. Complete disconnect. But nevertheless, both of those statements are true. So it's kind of deceptive. You can have true statements in a deductive argument. It has nothing to do with its validity. Validity means premises are supporting the conclusion. Okay. So I know that's a lot. I know it's mind numbing, but you are now eagles flying, ready to take your exams. You are no longer eaglets that need to be pushed out of the nest. I think I've given you enough examples. So with that being said, take a deep breath in. When the exam comes, take your time, use your cheat sheet, read through your books, okay? And watch my video. If you have any questions, just let me know. Good luck.